um, a contract's never going to be perfect. Like it's never going to cover everything. Okay. So what you want to do is you're trying to take as many issues off the table as you can. So you know, okay, well, it's not going to be an issue about the day of the event because that's written down. And so to the extent that you can find some resources online and put together at least something minimal that covers the basics, you know, some of these are who's paying for what, you know, when is payment going to be, what are you showing up, what are your responsibilities. I mean, most of us can sort of look at a calendar, figure out the day, we know how to count money, we know our names, we can put together our, all that information, and then you can always come back and have an attorney review it. But, you know, my big thing is you really do have to go with that and start with whatever it is, even if it's something very minimal. I think it can be better than nothing in a lot of cases. And I don't want to be the fifth one. I think you're going to chime in. Absolutely, on that. right? It's very important. Just to sort of elaborate on points regarding the drone sector of everything, if you are actively using a drone or a UAV to film or hiring pilots to do that, just make sure they are a Part 107 license, which is the FA licensure for flying commercial drones. Um, a lot of people think that in the art world, because it's, it sort of does kind of cross that line of, of fun recreation into job, that they don't need that professional licensure to do that, and you absolutely do. Um, so just make sure you have that place. And as a follow-up to that, a lot of people don't realize that North Carolina has a very robust set of laws pertaining to drones and UAVs. So in addition to having the FAA sort of masterminding everything, you've got the state of North Carolina that also has a licensure for professional drone use. They have their own body of laws regarding drones. And to add to all that fun, now we have local ordinances as well, particularly in the city of Raleigh. So it's sort of a three-layer dynamic. And I will just say from my experience helping people navigate that world, um, no one really knows about any of it. <laughs> so you have some law enforcement who are very gut ho about enforcement. You have other law enforcement who have no idea it exists. So it's very inconsistently applied. So just um, connect with someone who knows what they're talking about. I'm always down for coffee or just to answer a very short email about yes, what you're doing is fine or no, you should look into this law or absolutely not, run away really fast. Um, I'm happy to have those conversations as a courtesy. Also joining the drone meetup, we do education on the different legal dynamics as well as other topics just to get people educated because it is such a new area. But just when you're out filming with the drone, just make sure you have those three layers covered and can sort of mark, mark the box of I've looked into the FAA, I've looked into the state stuff, and I know that no local ordinances are going to intersect with this. And then hopefully no one will get in trouble and I will get them all. So, always a good thing. Um, to sort of touch on something Sheila said, it's important to understand that under federal law, you cannot transfer a copyright unless it's in writing signed by the author. So the description that she gave of this person who did all of the legwork and didn't transfer it, they had every right not to do that. They, that's something that should have been negotiated up front. Uh, our practice is kind of strange in that it was started as a traditional media law practice of representing newspapers. We represent TV uh, stations and people and all of that sort of stuff, radio people. Uh, but also we represent other creators of content, so architects. You hire an architect to design you a building. If that contract doesn't say they're transferring their, their design to you, you just have a license to use it. Uh, to bring a, something very near and dear to my heart at the moment, if you drew the circle of Rockingham Speedway and US run, one runs right next to it and across the way is Rockingham Dragway, we don't own that. The festival that we're going on, that is going on is at the dragway. Well, we've got 253 acres of camping and food trucks and food truck mutinies and things like that. Uh, but we were very purposeful in that you've got the oval and we drew a wedge to US one so that we could have our programming there. These are, this is a huge music festival producer. I kept waiting for them to say, um, we're gonna need to come through there. There's all, all these people sitting at the table. Nobody ever mentioned it. And last week, they're like, why are you setting stuff up there? I'm like, well, it's our wedge, but we're gonna need to get through there. Huh, then we're gonna need a, thing, a few things from you. And that's sort of the way it goes. It would have been a very easy thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it would be a, have been a very easy thing. One of the weird things that I do is a lot of law firm divorce work where lawyers fall to fighting. I'll let you in on a little secret. They don't put it in writing either. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I just shake my head and say, what are you doing? They, uh, and they don't. And so they, they fall to fighting. Literally, if you can have an email 
billing stage that that's all you can do, that's fine. But to transfer that copyright, in my opinion, you're going to need somebody to print it out and sign it so that it's done and you hold that in. This is your work. This is doing all the creative stuff is really important. And I, I for years, gave sort of a, a week-long lecture to watercolor painters. <coughs> and I would say, all of that is really cool, but if you want to keep being able to be a watercolor painter for your livelihood, you ought to know something about the business side of it and keeping track of your stuff and saying no and knowing what, who you're paying what and what things cost and all of that. It's really boring, I get it. But it's the only thing that feeds that engine for you to do it the next time. And so uh, any of us, I mean, we all, we're all here as volunteers. We like creative people. Perhaps we're struggling, non-creative, or not as creative as we want to be. And so we want to help you all. Uh, but we'll lose patience really fast if you're like, I don't have time for that. You make time. It's, it's paying your bills. It's doing all that sort of stuff. I would say, as a producer, if you're working on a project and you don't have a producer and you don't know anything about the business side of filmmaking, get a producer um, who actually has that experience. Because there have been a lot of times that I have, you know, kind of found projects where people have asked for help. And the first thing, to back up Sheila's point, is that you know, we're documentary filmmakers. We don't have a lot of money. And so we try to do these shortcuts where you're like, well, I'm just gonna do this little thing and we're just gonna be casual about it and no one ever gets anything in writing or you just don't have the money to pay a lawyer at that time. But I would just say, even if you have to find a producer who has some prior templates or some example contracts and you're going off something like that, um, it's a lot better to have some sort of protection in mind than going into it with no protection. Um, so, Find someone who does know what they're doing as far as the business side, I would say, before you start running out and making a film. It's really exciting to actually go out and find this project and make a film, but um, the, one, the one piece of advice I tell people all the time is, right now the technology is available. Anybody can make a film. Not everybody can sell a film. Um, and there's a lot of business and legal things that need to happen in order for you to be able to sell that product to whoever. Netflix, HBO, whatever. I would also say if you're a beginning filmmaker and just don't know where to start um, and you think you have the creative part down but don't know about the business side, um, look for jobs as a post-production um, assistant, a post-production associate producer, something like that because you're going to get a crash course in all things legal because you're going to be looking at every frame of footage you're gonna learn how to go into a scene, look for artwork, look for water bottles, look for logos, anything like that. You're going to get a really quick education on what not to do out in the field, which is gonna prepare you for that next job. give some of it away, do so jealously. If you have to lend it to somebody, that's even better because they're going to give it back to you. And so you're controlling that uh, intellectual property. I'm sure you would say that's hard to do because people, if they're going to hand you money, they're going to want something in return. So, so you grab as much of it as you can as it's leaving your hand. And, and that's the, the negotiation part of it. But in the absence of a contract, does a person do Yes. 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 Uh, or, or the microphone. Well, you could argue the, the, the boom. The director just has the idea. Right. 
it's not copyrightable until it's in a tangible form. Guess who's holding the camera? Flying the camera, right? Not you. Used to be. I got replaced by a toy. I don't think we need to get into a little bit of the copyright. Not down totally in the weeds, but a little bit of copyright. But generally, if you think as an artist, if you create something, then you want to be able. You should be the one to be able to protect that. And any rights beyond your right for what you created, you're giving that to somebody else for money or for whatever. It needs. It should be in writing. But otherwise, it's assumed that if you created it. So let's talk about, you're talking about, you know, being in like post-production and, and looking for water bottles and stuff. So the, the question is, you know, you're filming outside, what's, what's the, you know, why can't you just film whatever? So, you know, what are, let's talk about the, you know, what you can film and what you can, um, and copyright, and do you want to, you know, I know Mike has some experience. I should. I should probably let these guys go first. Um, <laughs> as a producer and a filmmaker, um, I try to go into situations and get permissions. If you know it's going to be a huge event, you want to contact the media or press person and get all the permissions that you're going to need for your crew to be there. That being said, um, sometimes as a filmmaker, um, you ask for forgiveness and not permission. Um, it, it really depends on um, that is not a legally sound answer. <laughs> That's just some creative advice. Um, it really depends on the situation. That, but I'm not saying that everyone should go in and bend all the rules. But sometimes there are occasions where I do. <laughs> so, so I guess, from what um, a legal standpoint, what can you not film without permission? So most of what I represent, most of the folks I represent are journalists. So part of that was the other thing that, you know, what's a things to think about. Do I have the right to be here? Is the question. Is am I standing on a public street? I remember watching HBO and what's the name of it? I'm so tired. Uh, <laughs> the the spy show that was on HBO, young blonde woman. She was kind of homeland. That's showtime. Oh I'm sorry. <laughs> so, see? Uh, and I, I was I was watching and it was dark in our basement and I'm like, that's Fayetteville Street. Uh, and they put the, the Capitol down there. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and I'd started, you know, I was tired and started going off of, well, they had the right to be there. They were on public property, uh, blah, 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 blah. And so what we, what we train journalists is, do I have the right to be here? If I'm on a public right of way, street, sidewalk, whatever, you have a right to be there. Um, what do you have the right to film? Anything that the naked eye could see from that space, you have the right to be there. Uh, if you start zooming in, now you're getting into that, perhaps, if you have a giant telephoto lens, somebody's going to notice and say, what are you doing? One of my favorite days, I was, we had a construction case out on NC State's campus, and my partner asked me to go out there and videotape something. And so I was dressed in a suit. It was a hot day. I didn't want to be doing it, but this is something I know how to do. And this NC State police officer pulled up behind me, and so, what are you doing? And I, again, I'm holding a video camera. I'm like, I'm videotaping. And uh, he said, do you have permission to do that? And I said, I don't need that. And he said, I need to know who you have permission. And I said, I'm standing on a public sidewalk. And uh, he's like, sir, I need, I need to know exactly what you're doing. And I said, I turned around and I said, I am like the last person you want to have this conversation with. Uh, and he said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm literally a media lawyer here doing something that I don't want to be doing, and I'm in a bad mood. And he's like, well, they're worried. And I said, tell them not to worry. I'll be <laughs> to uh, but I had the right to be there. You will hear from property owners, the police, people who think they know what the hell they're talking about, <laughs> that you need to move. Know if you have the right to be there. If you move on to somebody else's property, do I have the right to be there? Well, if it's an apartment building and you have been invited by one of the tenants, you have the right to be there. Even though the property owner is saying, I'm the property owner, you need to get off. No, that tenant has a lease and they have the right to invite anyone they want on. Creative leases, and I've seen them say, you, we're not, your permission does not extend to filming and that sort of stuff. First time I saw it, at least I smiled, and nobody knew what it was for. But that's what it's for. So, do you have the right to be there? If not, from whom do I get permission? 
if you're with the police, there are a bunch of ride-along cases, they can't give you permission to come onto my property. That's a good way for both of you to get arrested. Uh, don't do that. If you have, if you want to be in someone's home, get a written agreement to be there, especially if you're doing an interview. Make it second nature. I'm getting out my gear. I'm going to need you to sign this. A location release and yeah. an appearance release. Right. Can I ask something like that? Yeah. So I just literally got to you two years ago. We got permission from the tenant and not the owner, and they had security cameras outside. We were filming outside that spot where we got permission. And because they were looking at the security cameras, someone came and kicked us off the property, and which like affected the project. We finished it. It was good. But so since it was outside of that location, Unless they're, the tenant's lease had the provision I'm talking about, which is, I think I've seen once, uh, that you, as the lease holder of a piece of real property, even the apartment building or my office or whatever, I have a right to come and go, and I have a right to bring on any invitee. That's just North Carolina property law, so no, I think you had the right to be there. Whether they want to fight about it and you guys end up in court over it, you know, that's another thing, but I think you had the right to be there, most likely. context of the material. Um, I would just say public figures are always fair game, always. Um, well, you can't like shoot into their home, into their private space, but their private um, space is private. 
but anything else is fair game. Um, but fair use is one of those things that it, to it applies to the context and the way in which you use the material. And I have always um, put together, usually when you're going to apply fair use, you get your film to like a rough cut slash fine cut stage, that middle ground where you're kind of putting all these things together. And then I engage my fair use lawyer and send it out and get an opinion. Um, and usually he's gonna want a log of all of the footage as it pertains to archival, what you have shot, um, and some of the questionable material. And then he's gonna go through and actually watch it and tell you this is okay. When you're building and crafting the material, when you start to change and move some of those things around and edit, it can affect the ability to use and apply fair use. So I would always just say be careful and hire a lawyer because if you feel like you're gonna get sued, um, you probably will and you're walking that line and it's better to get the fair use opinion. And a lot of places, if you try to sell your film to like, you know, Netflix or HBO or one of those things, they're going, if it's tricky material, um, for instance, I did a film about the Boston Marathon bombings that went forward with HBO and that was tricky in eight million different ways and we had to be really buttoned up as far as fair use and how we were actually using that material because when you're labeling someone a terrorist, um, you know, you need to be careful about your wording in so lots of different ways. <laughs> so one thing I will say with the fair use conversation is if you're using a journal you would be or a different area, but the content captured with the drone or UAV may be protected, the use of the drone may not. So in North Carolina specifically, we have a launch and recovery statute that basically says you can't launch or recover a drone from any state or private property without consent, which when you think about it, it's basically every piece of property except your own. Um, so to go back to our first topic of contracts, you wanna make sure that consent's in writing. Um, things like going through security checkpoints aren't gonna qualify as as we've learned in some recent cases I've tried. And then, um, once again, there's just a lot of confusion with the people enforcing these laws on those, those statutes in general, but you know what the drone's being used for, why you're using it. And so, if you do get arrested on that statute, they can technically put you in jail for 45 days. And they will always confiscate your drone. Um, and the two cases I've had, it's, we joke that it's, it's Wake County's method to get drones for their force because they will confiscate your drone. There's no way I can get it back as an attorney. So if you're using really expensive drones, be very conscious of that statute and make sure you're getting that consent in writing. So if you do get stopped, you can show them like, I'm good. Here's my consent paperwork. You know, move along. Um, and that way, even if you were still to get arrested, we would have a really great defense in court beyond just, I didn't know about the law, <laughs> um, which does not fly to Sheila said fair use is sort of the, because you didn't have permission. Um, I remember hearing, there's a media law conference we go to every couple of years, and it was the folks, the lawyers for ABC News were having to do clearances on movie trailers from Disney Studios. And finally they're like, what are we doing? Uh, we literally are hiring two sets of lawyers to talk to each other, we're from the same company. Um, and so the, uh, the head of ABC News at the time said, we're not doing this anymore. We're promoting their movie, we're using the trailers or whatever, they've given us promotional materials, we're not gonna clear it with them. Um, and that's part of the process that you're gonna have to go through of determining if you have fair use. Did I have permission to do this? Can I get permission? I can't get permission, well what can I do? Uh, you know, I want that, I need to figure out how to do it. And there's a bit of, uh, chicken that's played in that situation. I think we covered fair use in a short three weeks in my copyright class. Um, there is no definitive answer. If some lawyer tells you with great definition that you, this defense will work a fair use, you probably want to ask a different lawyer. It, it's degrees, it's not absolute certainty. Um, the, the why you're using it is also very important. If you're making a either a documentary or a, a feature film, you're less likely to, well, I think I would argue that documentary filmmakers are journalists. If, if uh, you all were hauled into court here to produce your uh, 
raw footage of something that, and it wasn't a newsworthy event, but is you were covering landing other people. We have a statue, a reporter shield statue. I would argue you're a journalist. But if you're a feature fi filmmaker, that goes away. This is a commercial enterprise. Um, people will argue that my clients, WREL, you know, they've got a lot of commercials. They're a commercial enterprise. So far, they're in the journalist bucket. And so you want to make sure of what am I doing this for? Um, and the other thing, and you probably experienced this, is I got permission to do this, but ooh, it would be cool to use it in this. Now you don't have any permission unless you've been fairly broad in your release that says you can use it for any purpose you want, and I wave, and blah, 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 blah. And so spending a few dollars on appearance release and location release is a really good idea. Something is better than that, uh, if you can swing that. So, um, any other thoughts about like, using things like other people's art, other people's um, logos, um, music? Um, any other tips about that? Or, yeah. or, other than, you know, make sure you didn't get a release or, or it might be free. Yeah, and one of the things, even about getting the release, is making sure that you're really clear about what it's for. So generally, here's the first thing I tell my clients. If they're getting ready to enter into this arena with somebody else and the other party says they don't have a contract, and my client, I'm like, oh, we love when the other side doesn't have a contract. Because then we get to craft it the way that we want to craft it. And so, you know, I tell my client, I'm like, tell me everything that you want to do with it because we want to put it as broad as possible. We know that now everything is going out into the internet. It's not just going out into the world. It's flying an airplane that has a potential, you know, if you're with Elon Musk, it may be on the moon. And so we're asking for, you know, the use that may be perpetual throughout the world and the universe. And so we're crafting really broad language in terms of that use. And that's everything from music to location releases, which I just finished working on. And it's just really helpful to have a really good conversation with my client to sort of understand what the client's going to be using it for to make sure we got as broad a coverage as we can. Like, I really, I love it when the other side doesn't have a contract. What so if you want product in your like product placement in your film? Like, how do you go about it? So yeah, I have done less of that. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. Generally, There's producers that specifically do product placement. Um, one that's based here in North Carolina is Mountain Girl Productions. Um, it's Kristen, I can't remember her last name. I think it's Thomas, but she just got married. Um, well, she got married a couple years ago. Um, she's based in Asheville, so you should look her up. But she does, she specifically does product placement. Mountain Girl Productions, Kristen Thomas. So putting a hat on of the property owner, when you want to go on the location, and we're just gonna be a couple of us. We're gonna have a couple of cameras and a boom mic. What is, if, let's say I'm inclined to give you permission, what is the first thing I'm gonna ask you about? How much am I getting What's that? How much am I getting paid? Sort of. What was that? How much money am I going to get paid? I think that's in the, the equation, but as the lawyer for the property owner, what am I going to ask? Where's this going to air? What's it going to be like? Not even there yet. Part of it? So many I need to see what kind of insurance you have, and I need to be labeled as an additional insured on your general liability policy. And I need to see that you have a workers' comp policy on the people, uh, or that these are subcontractors and they are appropriately. Uh, I was surprised when we negotiated with the producer of this music festival that the, the CEO is a, a lawyer, he's a media lawyer, uh, or an entertainment lawyer, and that wasn't one of the first discussions they had. And I thought, 90,000 people and we're not talking about insurance? This is insane. Uh, and that's part of the cost of doing business. When you're making your budget, you want insurance. The other thing you can get is liable insurance. You and need liability insurance and E&O insurance. But also liable. Right. Uh, and that's the process where they hire somebody like us to vet it before it's going to see the light of day 
to, to give you your risk assessment on whether the, the, it's defamatory and actually defamatory. Uh, and there are, there are lots of defenses to libel, and that's part of what our process. We do a lot of pre-production, uh, pre-publication or pre-broadcast review, and we give them, you know, unclear writing is dangerous writing. If you want to do it this way, we can slide you down the scale, but at the end of the day, you're going to tick that person off and they may sue you. Do we have this, you know, dump truck full of defenses? Sure, but you're, you're sharpening the stick and waving it at the bear. This is what you're going to deal with. Would you suggest or recommend regarding insurance? Uh, for general liability and errors and omissions? What are you talking about? So, so general liability and errors and omissions is something that most carriers will write. Uh, I'm trying to think of the media law insurers. The Hiscox, uh, Employers Ray, Lloyds of London does some of it, Chubb does some of it. I'm trying to think who hires us. That's the, pretty much the list of, I'm sure there are others. Oddly, and I have no idea why, Kansas City, Missouri is like the hub of media insurance in the United States. If you literally look it up, you'll find that there are four of them there. Um, and every now and then, one of the really big insurance companies will acquire one of them and you know they'll re re rebrand it as their own. Um, it's pretty important, in my opinion, that if you're doing, especially what I think is more journalism, uh, or you know, along the journalism spectrum, to have that libel insurance if you can afford it, because you're doing something that's probably, at some root, controversial. I mean, it's part of what you do. Uh, and so having that hires the likes of us to defend you. And uh, I have a, a, my partner, Amanda Martin, uh, has been a media lawyer her entire career, I think. So she's been in it 25 years. She taught me media law. There you go. She's <laughs> never tried. Uh, a libel case because she puts them to rest before they ever get to a trial. She's tried one case in her career and it was a, uh, uh, a medical privacy case. Uh, that she won. You know, so she's won to know. back to the marathon film that I shot, um, a lot of that, because we weren't there shooting the marathon, we didn't know this was gonna happen, was um, comprised of archival footage. Um, and I think in that shot there were 1,342 clips and 1,107 of them were some type of archive. And I had to clear 1,107 pieces of archive or get a fair use opinion. But, I'm just gonna tell you, your, your lawyer, your fair use lawyer is not gonna say like, oh yeah, all 1,107 of these are fair use available. Um, that's not gonna happen. So you're gonna have to clear and talk to the creators of all that footage. And you need to actually make sure 
that the person that you're talking to who put it up on the internet actually created that footage because that's another tricky area. Yes and no. Let me put it this way. Uh, my opinion would, would probably differ depending on who my client was, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, when I'm representing Capital Broadcasting, which owns WRAL, they've paid the three million dollars for the helicopter to put up and do all of that sort of thing, and you haven't, and so you're using it at great length to make your film and everything. We probably want to have a discussion. Uh, you're saying, hey, it was the only helicopter up and this was the most traumatic thing to happen to Raleigh in a long time and I should be able to steal snippets of it. Somewhere between the two, we should be able to find an agreement. But to assume this is a really important thing and I can use it is probably an unsafe assumption on your part. Um, I love the fair use doctrine. I love transformative works. I think it's some of the most fun things that creative people do because I'm just never cease to be amazed with what I see as a new story becomes you know, telling of a real story and, and it adds to the story and all of that and so I'm the guy that would be arguing if it wasn't my client's footage that you were using let's let's this, we need this as robust why it's a constitutional concept um, and so this is supposed to be the marketplace of ideas well we, that's what we need to promote I was, I was going to say something pejorative, and I don't want to. Uh, I'll do it this way. There is a lot of miserable intellectual property case law in existence because of the diametrically different resources that the owners of the content have versus the creative people who want to use it. If you've noticed that before every Disney movie, there's the little clip of Steamboat Willie, that's because the Disney trademark is about to expire. And not, sorry, not Disney, the copyright. And so they're trying to turn it into a trademark which doesn't have an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And so we keep seeing the extension of the copyright law. Guess who's paying for that? Our friends at Disney. They are lobbying the crap out in order to extend it. Why? Because they own all the content. They own that bundle of sticks. From a First Amendment creative uh, want to be lawyer? I don't know if that's the best thing for the marketplace of ideas. But that's not what we're here to discuss. Yeah, and the other caveat I would like to put on that is it depends on who is the broadcaster for your film. If it's someone reputable, not well, that's the wrong word. Um, if, if it's someone who Unlikely. thinks that they will easily be sued, you know, ITBS, HBO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they're gonna put you through the ringer for that footage and they're gonna expect to see your entire clearance log. If you are making a short film that you know you might host on your website that's gonna have a shorter lifespan, you know, there's not gonna be that many um, rigorous processes that you might have to go through. And I'll, I'll add this too, because I had a client who was working on a short film and she found some music online. She called me and she's like, Sheila, this music would be perfect. Do you think if I go and get and I said, you don't even go that way. <laughs> um, you know, I said, he's right there. Send him a, a DM him or something and ask, tell him what you want to use it for and ask him for permission. And that's exactly what she did. She said, here's what I want to use it for, do you mind? And the person said, go right ahead. You know, yeah. A lot of times people want you to share their work. Please credit us, link us back to our website. And so they may put stipulations like that on it, but a lot of times, especially small creators, they want to get their work out, and they are totally willing to like jump on board with you. I actually have a couple of personal projects that I've done, and I reached out to a friend who's a musician, and I was like, hey, I've heard this on your SoundCloud account. I want to use this song, this song, and this. I sent him a list of the songs that I wanted to use. And literally, he, was, he sent them to me in an email. He didn't even ask for credit. But of course, at the end, I was just like, here's where the music's from. You know? And so you do have creators out there, especially
especially the smaller creators, like they are looking for people who want to use their material. Bigger so, creators too. Yeah. Like Moby has like this whole SoundCloud. Um, do people listen to Moby anymore? I don't know. But he can make some really amazing soundtrack music and he will offer it to you for free if you send it. There's this form on the website. You send it in and say what you want to use it for and he sends you a letter and saying that you can use it. So. I think a lot of people are, especially documentarians, are afraid to ask for permission because, you know, they're gonna say, the first question, I agree with you, the first question is like, who are you doing this for? And then it comes back and you're doing it for someone big and they're like, oh, well, it's gonna be this huge sticker price. And so we get afraid to ask for permission, but a lot of times you just ask for permission, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, you do have to skirt around who is it for um, until they really nail you down. Um, and then you might be in a little bit of trouble with the price tag. But otherwise, just ask for permission. The worst they can say is no, and then you have to get your checkbook out. So we only have a few minutes left. I want to make sure I have another topic I can bring up. And since we have 10 minutes, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, distribution. If you're looking to like sell a project, um, to maybe you can tell, tell us about your experiences. But what is some of the checklist of things? Like, you know, like, hey, I, the end goal is to sell this, pitch it to an what are some things we can do legally to prepare for that? Um, first thing I would do is get a lawyer who can help you out with contracts. Um, and I would actually, it depends on if you're doing this as an original production for the broadcaster or if you're going to do it as an acquisition as to how rigorous those contracts need to be. Um, so they're kind of slightly different conversations. But if you're going to do an acquisition, you know, saying that your film is made and you're going to sell it to that person after the fact. Um, I would just make sure that your contracts are in place. Um, they're going to have an entire um, checklist that you're going to have to do. When it's called your deliverables. Um, and so they're going to put you through the ringer as far as all of your clearances, making sure you have proper permissions. Um, you're going to want to keep accounting and receipts um, of every penny that you spent on the film. Um, it's it's actually a quite extensive process for delivery, so I don't know if I can encapsulate it in this conversation. Um, but it's they're asking for a lot of legal paperwork, and you're also going to want to have a lawyer who's really versed in entertainment law to actually look over that contract before you sign it, because there are a lot of acquisitions that can get kind of shaky. Um, there's been instances where you know you might sell to a smaller distributor or broadcaster, but if they go out of business and they file for bankruptcy and you haven't gotten that check yet, your property is still theirs. Um, and so it's, you have to, you have to really know who you're getting in bed with. I would just put that on there. How do you even get to that point to be able to sell, like if you have the finished product, how do you find people? Is there some kind of Festivals? Like how to find Festivals are a great place to kind of get the word out about your film. What is um, just going to trying to get it into festivals. The other route is getting a sales agent, um, and a sales agent can actually go and pitch your product to all of these great people that they have relationships with. Any other questions? Yeah. What resources would you recommend to learn about entertainment law? You know, not going to school for it, but just so you can with an entertainment lawyer and know what they're talking about. Yeah. I got to make, make me tag on to that because that was going to be my closing question yeah, as well. well. You all know of, yeah, like websites, online resources, groups that would be helpful that you've used in the past or you know that are helpful to people just to, that, that before you hire a lawyer, is there somewhere you can go and look? Um. <laughs> resources than what well, I do. So. Right, yeah. yeah. And so, so here's generally what I do. So, so teaching entertainment business law for essential. So my head space around that is very different. It's totally around case law, which none of you, none of you want to read. Um, <laughs> but really, I tell my clients this all the time, to just Google what it is you're looking for. I mean, there's a lot of information. I mean, you, know, you do want to take into account what the source is. Okay, so you're looking for credible sources that have, um, that are known in the industry. And I think there are a lot of, you know, other educational institutions out there that provide it at a level that's for the 
lay person as opposed to the legal person. Um, and I tell my clients that all the time, even if they have something around a specific question, just to get them a little more prepared about what we're going to talk about when you do sit down with me, because it, it sort of helps if I, to use their time a little bit better if they have sort of like a base of knowledge and they can come to the table because then they have a chance to go, okay, so I read this, Sheila, and here's what I'm thinking, and how is this going to work? And so I think I'm better able to help them out. But I definitely tell people, you know, start to do some research on your own. Just Google what it is you're looking for and try to become a little bit familiar. We all know, you know, not to think that everything on the internet is, is credible, but but well, that's a base for, yeah. for but it's and an I will also say that to be very much beware, and all the lawyers will say this, on the online contract forms, yeah. um, because as everyone has set up here, you know, you can have one little, you know, all sorts of little specific things in your contract, and they may say employment contract, but it doesn't say employment contract for which side, or for what type of situation, or what state. And, what state. Yeah. and so, beware of the um, online contract, but there is a lot of online, you do a group of, a lot of online on general issues for like fair use and things, yes. Um, I have a resource actually. Um, oh, please. It's called, it's a book called The Fairness of Copyright. Yeah. My wife is office and it has a bunch of contract notes in it as well. I'll take those into it's what I know is the case of this. And Donaldson? Yeah. Sorry, Donaldson is also one of the like preeminent fair use um, lawyers. Um, they are kind of have a reputation for never losing a fair use case. And they will deliver an opinion letter that's like literally, you know, sometimes, well, the one we got for Marathon was like over 100 pages long. I don't know what it was, I just passed it over to you. And, and let me also say, the university <laughs> also used to, I, I don't know how recently they've updated this, but they used to do sort of like a little um, cartoon-like little book about copyright. Um, that was very, that was very much at a level that people could understand. I would encourage you, whether it's a four-year university or a community college, take a business law class. It gives you some of the just the terminology so that you know this is what we're talking about. Because really, we're just tailoring a, a written agreement to the particular industry. So if you've got that foundational vocabulary, then what, well, what you need to ask for, oh, right? You know. The worst thing in the world is not knowing what you don't know. Um, and so, uh, I don't know how to ask for it. Well, okay, I took this business law class. They were talking about leases. Do I need all this sort of stuff? And it's like, well, you need parts of that. You know, you go from there. So our time is officially up. Um, and I will say, too, if you don't know about Triangle Artworks, you need to go on our website, triangleartworks.org. Um, plus, um, we have a very, very active social media platform at Tri Artworks on Twitter and others. Go on the website. You find us. But also on our website we have resources, so we have a whole page of legal resources where there's a whole lot of, um, we've already, the USC Law students have already done the vetting for you and found great copyright, great fair use, and other other websites. Um, we also Law Plus Artworks, um, and we have a marketing group, and now we're growing an accounting group. We, we, do, we do regular um, um, workshops for artists on fair use and copyright and trademark Lots of um, lots of other. I think on the 23rd we're doing one on accounting for artists. If you're a full-time working artist and need help with your accounting, we have a CPA that's doing that at the end of the month. Um, so there's a lot of resources and other work that we do to follow what we're doing. Um, and I want to thank all of y'all. I thank everybody for getting up. <laughs>